Flight School Blast Off is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. In conjunction with the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center, with a generous grant from FCA Nova, the Armed Forces Communication and Electronics Association, Northern Virginia Chapter. Welcome to the National Air and Space Museum's Stephen F. udvar Hazy Center, located in Chantilly, Virginia. Today, we're going to explore the history of rocketry, the space program, how rockets work, and much more. Right now, flights will blast off with Kirsten Salpini. In historic terms, humans only achieved space flight a few decades ago. We're still taking our first baby steps into space. But did you know that the basic technology that lets us travel to space and maneuver there was created over a thousand years ago? I'm speaking, of course, about rockets. In the first century AD, the Chinese invented a simple form of gunpowder. At some point, this powder was packed into bamboo tubes and the first fireworks were born. Later, the Chinese discovered that these tubes could launch themselves, leading to the development of the first true rockets, fire arrows. During the latter part of the 17th century, an English physicist, Sir Isaac Newton, laid the first scientific foundations for modern rocketry. Newton organized his understanding of the way objects move into three scientific laws. These laws explain why rockets work the way they do, and why they are even able to work in the vacuum of outer space. Newton's laws impacted the way people designed and built rockets. In 1898, Konstantin Tsiolovsky, a Russian schoolteacher, proposed the idea of space exploration by rocket. Also, in a report he published five years later, Tsiolovsky suggested that rockets could achieve greater distances if they used liquid propellants. It wasn't until 1926 that Tsiolovsky's dream of a liquid-fueled rocket became a reality. On March 16th of that year, a brilliant American scientist and inventor, Dr. Robert Goddard, launched a gasoline-fueled rocket that traveled 184 feet in just under three seconds. There are a lot of people who believe that the Kitty Hawk of spaceflight took place in March of 1926 when Robert Goddard launched the first liquid-fueled rocket in Massachusetts. And there's good reason to believe that. It wasn't a very impressive flight in very many ways. It didn't go up very high. But for the first time ever, the technology necessary to send people into space was demonstrated for literally the world to see and that makes it a very important and significant event. Around the same time that Dr. Goddard was conducting his research, Hermann Oberth of Germany published a book about rocket travel to outer space. His writings were important. Because of him, small rocket societies began to spring up all over the world. In Germany, the formation of one such society, the Society for Space Travel, led to the development of a rocket called the V-2, which was used during World War II. As Allied armies liberated Europe in 1945, Werner von Braun and other V-2 experts surrendered to the U.S. Army and revealed the capabilities of their rockets. The U.S. picked up as much of that knowledge as they could by collecting the technology itself as well as the people who had built it to see what they could learn from it and obviously move beyond it. But in many respects that V-2 is, is, a, is a core milestone in the history of flight. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, 
the United States Army, Navy, and Air Force tested and further refined V-2 rocket technology. During this same time, the Soviet Union was also making its own refinements to the V-2 design. Both sides were driven by the desire to create a rocket powerful enough to deliver an atomic warhead deep within enemy territory, a rocket called the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, or ICVM. These powerful rockets became the starting point of the United States space program. For half a century, the United States and the Soviet Union competed against one another. Before a watchful world, each side sought to demonstrate its superiority through impressive feats in rocketry and spaceflight. Rockets like the Redstone and others with names like Atlas, Titan, and Saturn eventually launched astronauts into space and carried us to the moon. Thanks, Kirsten. Let's explore the science of rocketry and how rockets work. Fight School sent a camera into the laboratory of a world-renowned rocket pioneer. I got it, I got it, yes, yes. I'm coming in, I'm coming in. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Red Rose on, oh, 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 oh! oh! Hello? <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> oh. Thank you, Catherine, for inviting me to present to oh, you. Kate! The host's name is Kate. Uh, yes, yes, very well. But, but, but who are you? Uh, I'm Nicole. I'm a reporter with Flight School. Uh, oh, very good. Thank you, Katie. In its simplest form, a rocket is a chamber enclosing a gas under pressure. A small opening at one end of the chamber allows the gas to escape, providing the thrust that propels the rocket in the opposite direction. A good example of this is a balloon. When we think of rockets, we rarely think of a balloon, but a rocket can be anything. A missile, aircraft, or vehicle that expels fast-moving gas or fluid to obtain thrust. Remember, thrust is one of the four forces of flight that we talked about in the first two Flight School episodes. Thrust is a force that propels an airplane forward or a rocket upward. In the year 1687, Sir Isaac Newton published a book in which he described three important scientific principles that govern the motion of all objects. Today we call these principles Newton's Laws of Motion. Simply put, they state, an object at rest will stay at rest, and an object in motion will stay in motion in a straight line unless acted upon by an outside force. Force is equal to mass times acceleration, and for every action, there is always an equal and opposite reaction. Over time, people experimenting with rocket designs began to use Newton's laws to inform and improve their work. Yes, but, but unknowing and understanding Newton's laws and building a successful rocket are hardly the same thing. Let's take a look at some of the practical concerns rocket designers wrestled with. A propellant is the fuel that... But it's not. Not what? Not just a fuel. Propellant means both fuel and oxidizer. Well, yes, of course, I, I was getting to that. In rockets, propellant means both fuel and oxidizer. The fuel is the chemical the rocket burns. But for burning to take place, an oxidizer, or oxygen, must be present. Jet airplanes draw oxygen into their engines from the surrounding air. Rockets don't have that luxury. They must carry their own oxygen with them, particularly in space where there is no air. Early rockets all used solid propellants like gunpowder to generate thrust. Modern rockets operate with either solid or liquid propellants. Dr. Goddard's 1926 rocket used gasoline. The V-2 used alcohol and liquid oxygen. The space shuttle uses both solid and liquid propellants. Liquid propellant rockets are much more complex than solid propellant rockets. They use high pressure pumps, fuel injectors, and complex control and cooling systems to maintain performance. All these mechanics add a lot of weight. With any rocket, weight is an important factor. In general, the heavier the rocket is, the more thrust it needs to get off the ground. But building an efficient rocket engine is only part of the problem in producing a successful rocket. The rocket must also be stable in flight. A stable rocket flies in a smooth, uniform direction. But an unstable rocket flies along an erratic path, sometimes tumbling or changing direction. Spinning or tumbling always takes place around one or more of the three axes of flight, pitch, roll, and yaw. 
The point where all three of these axes meet on an object is known as the center of gravity. Let me show you. I'll use this rocket here to, to shift the gravity. For rockets, the pitch and yaw axes are the most important because movement in either of these two directions will cause a rocket to travel off course. The roll axis is the least important because movement here will not alter the rocket's flight path. In fact, it will help to stabilize it in flight, much the same way a spiral pass stabilizes a football. Another important factor to consider when building a rocket is its mass. Large rockets capable of carrying vehicles into space have a very large mass. To reach space in orbital velocity, a great deal of propellant is needed. To combat this problem, rocket designers developed multi-stage rockets like the Saturn V or the Space Shuttle. Multi-stage rockets are several rockets stacked on top of one another. When the lower, larger rockets become exhausted, they are dropped and left behind, and the next rocket in the system ignites. Multi-stage rockets have made it possible for us to travel to the moon, and they'll certainly be used to take us to other planets in the future. Thank you for joining us today. Back to you, Katie. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, still ahead on the show, our student reporters take on a space shuttle mission. Then we learn how astronauts and ships keep their cool during the heat of reentry. But first, we go to downtown Washington, D.C. and flight school's Gloria Powell at the National Air and Space Museum for a, a space race. Gloria? On October 4th, 1957, a mysterious object entered space above the Earth. Orbiting 560 miles above our planet, it emitted a series of strange blips and beeps. Called Sputnik, this object was the first man-made satellite ever launched into orbit. I'm here at the National Air and Space Museum in downtown Washington, D.C., where you can see a replica of Sputnik. Weighing in about 183 pounds, Sputnik was a round, metallic satellite that transmitted pressure and temperature information by radio waves. The surprise launch of Sputnik by the Soviet Union sent a shockwave of uneasiness and anxiety throughout America. Congress, perceiving a threat to U.S. security, urged President Eisenhower to take immediate and swift action. The space race was on. On January 31, 1958, the U.S. Army missile team, led by Werner von Braun, successfully launched the first U.S. artificial satellite into orbit. Later, in July of 1958, President Eisenhower signed the National Aeronautics and Space Act and NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration was formed. One of NASA's first acts was to initiate Project Mercury, an attempt to prove that human space flight was possible. Mercury had three goals, to orbit a manned spacecraft around the Earth, to investigate man's ability to function in space, and to recover both man and spacecraft safely. In 1959, NASA began testing a variety of rockets and designs as part of Project Mercury. Little by little, scientists gathered pieces of information assembling like a puzzle, the building blocks of successful human spaceflight. At the same time, the Soviet Union was also testing new rockets and spacecraft designs. On April 12, 1961, the Soviet Union achieved another early victory in the space race. Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first person to enter space and orbit the Earth, but the United States was not far behind. 23 days later, astronaut Alan Shepard became the first American to enter suborbital space aboard a Mercury Redstone rocket. President John F. Kennedy marked the occasion with a speech before the nation. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. President Kennedy upped the ante in the space race. For the first time, the nation had a clear goal, to beat the Russians to the moon. The next step toward achieving that goal happened in February of 1962. Riding in this capsule, astronaut John Glenn became the first American to successfully orbit the Earth. However, achieving the larger goal, the goal of sending people to the moon and back again, would take a bit longer to realize. New technologies would need to be invented, a new spacecraft would need to be designed and tested, and a new rocket would need to be built, a rocket large enough to get us there. And just how far away is the moon? Between 225 and 252 
thousand miles away. That's about as many miles your parents will put on the family car if they drive it for 10 years. Once Project Mercury proved that human spaceflight was possible, NASA initiated Project Gemini. Project Gemini had three main goals, to subject multiple people and equipment to space flight for longer durations, to rendezvous and dock with orbiting vehicles, and lastly, to perfect methods of entering the atmosphere and landing at a pre-selected point. In all, 12 Gemini missions were launched from 1964 to 1966, and all three of the mission objectives were achieved. I'm standing next to the Gemini 4 capsule that was launched in space in June of 1965. Gemini 4 is important because it illustrates another important goal of the Gemini program, extravehicular activity, or EVA, also known as spacewalking. On the third day of the mission, tied on by tether, astronaut Edward White left the cabin of this small spacecraft and became the first American to spacewalk. I feel like a million dollars. I'm going to pick up. With the success of Project Gemini, NASA's efforts turned toward the Apollo program. The Apollo program had several key goals, among which were to carry out a program of scientific exploration of the moon and to develop man's capability to work in a lunar environment. Apollo missions featured a three-person crew in a three-part spacecraft consisting of a command module, a service module, and a lunar landing module, like the one seen behind me. The three modules were carried into space on top of a massive Saturn V rocket. Fully assembled, a Saturn V rocket and spacecraft weighed over 6 million pounds and stood 363 feet high. That's taller than a 36-story building. The Saturn V was a three-stage rocket developed at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center under the direction of Werner von Braun. The first stage of the rocket used five engines producing 7.7 .7 million pounds of thrust. These powerful engines were needed to lift the rocket fast enough to escape Earth's gravity. Millions of people watched around the world on television as Apollo 11 astronaut Neil Armstrong stepped off the Eagle lunar module onto the surface of the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. After two and a half hours exploring the lunar surface and taking samples, the astronauts left behind an American flag and a plaque bearing the inscription, Here men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 1969 A.D. We came in peace for all mankind. On July 24, the Apollo 11 command module, seen here at the National Air and Space Museum, splashed down in the Pacific Ocean. The race to the moon had ended. But what about the race to space? Some historians argue that the race ended with the first moon landing. Others argue that the race didn't truly end until 1975, when the United States and Soviet Union conducted the first joint mission in space, Apollo-Soyuz. This milestone in space history is depicted here in the Space Race Gallery. Well, that's all for now from the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. I'll catch you back later at the Udvar Hadzi Center. you know that many of the first astronauts were decorated combat pilots and test pilots in the armed forces? Today, astronauts come from all walks of life. NASA is always on the lookout for talented mission specialists who bring to the space program a wide variety of expertise in engineering, biology, chemistry, physics, mathematics. Even teachers can be astronauts too. Who knows, NASA may even have a space for you. At NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center near Washington, D.C., scientists and engineers are working to pave the way to future flights to the moon. Flight School traveled to Goddard to introduce you to Dr. April Erickson, an aerospace engineer with NASA. Well, my favorite saying is uh, shoot for the moon, and even if you miss, you'll still be amongst the stars. We've been explorers for so long. You know, we started off exploring continents, then, you know, crossing seas and oceans, and, um, and now we're exploring into the, you know, the heavens, as we say. For me, I often remind people that we still know so little bit about the mechanisms of the Earth. Okay, can we really still tell the weather precisely? No. So there are a lot of things that are occurring right here in the Earth that we're still investigating and trying to be, you know, to understand. 
And then some of the ways that we understand them are by going out and looking at other planets and looking at how they evolve. Lola is a laser altimeter and it will look at the lunar surface, the moon. And so we'll have a much better mapping of its surface from you know, what we've mapped in the past. With this, it's just one of one instrument on the uh, LRO, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter mission. Um, it's very cool to see the whole instrument built together, put together. We're now in what we call um, thermal vacuum testing, and that's where we pump it down to um, a pressure very similar to space, and then we cycle through different temperatures that would correlate to what it would experience in space, you know, hot and cold, and whether the instrument, in a sense, would break. We're not trying to break it, but you want to make sure it's not going to break. And this is the way that you validate it will work in space. So we're outside the clean area that's just outside of the thermal vac chamber. The reason why we keep everything clean of particles and dust is because any of that can actually short out the equipment. So we make sure that when the people are inside in the bunny suits, they're grounded for static electricity reasons as well as keeping any dust and particles. Lots of things can short out the moisture, so we have you know humidity uh, monitor in there, and then we're looking at the particles and all that other stuff. There's a, quite a few things that could make something go wrong, and so we just try to negate any possibilities of that happening. So these guys will take your order and clean it to the specifications that you ask. So this is where we do our first real thorough cleaning of any equipment or parts. One particular that we're very um, clear and try to identify is silicon. So silicon contaminants cause a lot of problems for us. And so we always make sure to try to identify and make sure that there's no silicon present. So living on a different planet, that's an enormous challenge. You know, we don't have this big blue atmosphere to protect you and things are very harsh. You know, you look at the Martian surface, you've got dust storms all the time, you know, the atmosphere is not quite the same. It's, you know, there's just lots of different challenges and um, it pushes us. I think it makes us better as um, humans. The really cool thing is the things I work on at NASA go up in space, so I still can say I'm touching the heavens with my work. I'm joined now by Amanda Young, the curator of astronaut equipment from the Early Space Program for the National Air and Space Museum. Now, Amanda, can you tell us a little bit about the environment in space and why we need spacesuits? Well, man or humans are designed to live on Earth, mm -hmm. where there is oxygen and the pressure to push the oxygen into your lungs. And when you go out into, the spa into space, there's none of that. There's no air, there's no oxygen, there's no pressure, there's... There's nothing. There's nothing. That's hard it, to imagine, there's nothing. I know, it's very hard. So, it, so what do you need a spacesuit for if there's nothing out there? Well, you need a spacesuit to keep you warm, to keep you cool, um, to provide the oxygen for you to breathe, the pressure to push the air into your lungs, and also to protect yourself from micrometeoroids. Micrometeoroids, and, and what are those? Little pieces of rock that are flying around. So they could get hit by rocks while they're out there? They could, but very tiny ones. So this is, acts like a suit of armor, too? In many ways, w yes. Well, what's it made of? What are spacesuits made of? Um, spacesuits are made of uh, Apollo spacesuits are, are 26 layers of polyester, dacron, nylon, and a cover layer of Teflon-coated fiberglass. Are they heavy? Yes, an Apollo spacesuit weighed about 58 to 60 pounds. 58, and you said Apollo. There's 50, you have to be strong to wear those. You did indeed. All right, well, yeah. thank you very much for being with us, Amanda. Oh, you're quite welcome. Yes. Well, after the show, we'll take a moment, I hope you take a moment, to visit Flight School's website. There you can see an exclusive behind-the-scenes video featuring curator Amanda Young as she shows off some of the amazing artifacts in the Smithsonian's collection. Here's a sneak peek. I have here... Gordon Cooper's Mercury training glove. He wore this during training before the um, before his mission. It's, I mean, it's a fabulous glove. But it's got the, one of the neat things about it is it's got leather palms and little little holes there, which helped to uh, so that it wasn't slippery. Here is Alan Shepard's Mercury suit. He wore this on Freedom Seven. Um, this is one of the, this is the first of the U.S. space suits. 
I have something else here which is kind of fun, and this is the most gorgeous thing in the world. Just gorgeous. The next to last boot that ever walked on the moon. That's unbelievable. Isn't it fabulous? Yes. It's absolutely fabulous. It's stunning. Look at that. Those are the tread marks that left all those wonderful prints, footprints on the moon. This is the best of the lot. This is Neil Armstrong's Apollo 11 helmet. And he wore this in July of 1969. It's an over helmet and it fitted over the pressure bubble and was held in place with this, this clasp. And it has two visors on the inside. One is a clear visor, which is a poly, uh, polycarbonate visor with UV filtering. And then of course, Ta-da! Isn't that gorgeous? While we're on the subject of space program artifacts, let's take a moment to learn about some of the amazing spacecraft here at the Smithsonian's Udvar-Hazy Center. Flight School's Kevin Clay is standing by. Kevin? Thanks, Kate. The first capsule I want to show you is the Mercury Capsule Freedom 7-2. The first American in space, Alan Shepard, hoped to fly this capsule on an orbital mission scheduled for the fall of 1963. However, his mission was canceled so that NASA could focus its effort on Project Gemini. Curator Valerie Neal has more. So the spacecraft was already, he had already named it Freedom 72 and he never got to fly in it. As a result though, it is a complete spacecraft. It's fully equipped. If we wanted to launch it tomorrow, <laughs> we probably could. But what's unusual about it is it still has the nose cap at the top with the parachutes packed in it and it still has the complete heat shield and retro rocket package at the bottom. The spacecraft behind me is the Gemini 7. It was launched on December 4, 1965 and carried astronauts Frank Borman and James Lovell into space. Their primary mission was to see if humans could live in weightlessness for 14 days. Here's curator Valerie Neal with more. And if you look into the spacecraft and imagine spending two weeks with even your very best friend or even your sister or brother in a space that cramped, I mean, there is less space in there than there is in a typical car. You can imagine that that might be a little too close for comfort for a little too long. This next capsule is an Apollo Command Module Boiler Plate. A boiler plate is an engineering test model used to train a spaceship's crew for flight. This particular model was used by the Navy to train personnel on how to retrieve a capsule from the ocean after its return from orbit. There is in fact a big horse collar around the base and that was attached by the Navy divers who were dropped by helicopter into the water to assist the astronauts in getting out of the spacecraft and the collar helped to stabilize it in the waves of the ocean so that they could open the hatch and get the crew out more easily. After the Apollo missions to the moon came to an end, the United States had to decide what to do next in space. NASA scientists began looking for a less expensive way to keep the United States in outer space. They wanted spaceflight to become more routine and usable for practical benefits. Out of that desire came this, the Space Shuttle. The Space Shuttle is part rocket, part airplane, and part glider. It is wings and wheels like an aircraft, launches into and maneuvers through space with rocket engines, and lands back on Earth like a glider. The shuttle was designed to land on a runway like an airplane, not splash down in the ocean like the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo capsules. The space shuttle here at Udvarhazy is named Enterprise. The Enterprise served as a full-scale test vehicle. NASA never equipped her for spaceflight. The Enterprise was built to see if the shuttle could fly and be controlled in the atmosphere, as well as land safely on the ground. From the late 1970s through the early 1990s, five space-ready shuttle orbiters rolled off the assembly lines, Columbia, Challenger, Atlantis, Discovery, and Endeavour. The first space shuttle to travel into Earth orbit was the Columbia on April 12, 1981. Since then, the shuttles have flown over 120 missions combined. One of the first things you notice about the space shuttle when compared to the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo is its size. This thing is huge. The shuttle can carry roughly 80,000 pounds of cargo, which equals about six Apollo command modules. The space shuttle carries a crew of between five and seven astronauts, 
but can hold up to 11 if needed in an emergency. One of the main differences between the space shuttle and other spacecraft that came before it is the space shuttle is like a giant 18-wheeler in space. It has a large payload compartment that's been used to ferry satellites like the Hubble Space Telescope and components and modules for the International Space Station into space. Well, that's all for now from the floor of the space hangar. Let's rejoin Kate on the Enterprise deck. Kate? Thanks, Kevin. There's another special person I want you to meet. He's flown not just once, but three times on the space shuttle. Say hello to astronaut William Reedy. You, you love to wake up in the morning, go to work up in space. Well, I, was, uh, I was very fortunate to fly three space shuttle missions. They were all very different. The first one, uh, I was the orbit pilot, also was a, a mission specialist, got to do uh, science and, and train for, for spacewalks. It was a laboratory mission. The laboratory is about the size of a school bus, and it was back in the, the shuttle payload bay. My second flight was, uh, was quite a bit different from that. It was a uh, flight where we had a communication satellite that we deployed. Then we had an ultraviolet telescope that uh, we used the robot arm and the shuttle to deploy. Uh, and then we separated from it and then came back and got it five days later. The final flight was uh, as the commander of uh, the shuttle on a docking mission to the Russian space station Mir. Uh, so three different missions, all very different. It's kind of odd because you look at the space shuttle, it looks the same on the launch pad every time. So one of the things that you do as, as the shuttle commander is, is you, you try and train everybody, brief everybody, that when they first get to space, first thing they do is, is complete their checklist items and then it's mandatory for them to look out the window. You see stars in the daytime up in space. You see the Earth with this very, very thin veneer of an, an atmosphere, this very thin coating of, of, of air that's, that's it's actually not quite blue, it's, it's, more, it's more translucent. And the impression that you have as you look back is that it's a tiny planet, that there's only one ocean and there's only one atmosphere, and it's all connected. And, and you can see it, literally, as, as you go around it 16 times every day. But what you don't see when you look back at the Earth is you don't see any political boundaries. You don't see any divisions that, that are caused by cultural or language differences or you know, racial differences or, or religion. You don't, you don't see any of that. That would probably be the, the, the biggest lesson to learn is that we're all in this together. We all share this one planet. And, and that maybe the differences that we seem to, to pick at uh, most of our lives here uh, aren't as significant as we make them day in and day out. What, what I liked about uh, being an astronaut, uh, you know, you're flying jet airplanes, you get to fly in space, you know, you get to do so many interesting things. You get to learn so many new things. Every single day you're learning something new. I think the most difficult thing about flying in space is knowing that you have to come home because you realize that, that the time up there is very limited. And, and I mean, yeah, you miss everybody, uh, but, but you realize that you know, this is you know, a very, very special uh, thing that you've been able to do. And, and, and coming home is hard. You know, you wanna take that one last look out the window. You wanna, you wanna make those memories and, and, and kind of you know, freeze dry them so that, uh, so that they don't fade because uh, it's such a, a, a remarkable, remarkable experience. That is amazing. Well, our student reporters are ready for their first space shuttle mission. Let's join them and Udvar Hazi's aerospace educator in residence, Dick Unzer, down at the mission trainer. Dick? Hi, Kate. I'm here in our mission trainer, and we're over here at Houston Space Center getting ready to monitor the launch of the space shuttle. And right now, we're at one minute and counting, and we have three folks here at, at our computer terminals monitoring the launch of our space shuttle. First, we have Kirsten's, our flight director for this mission. We have Gloria is the flight dynamics officer and Kevin is our spacecraft systems officer and they'll be monitoring the flight today and monitoring what takes what happens during takeoff. 20 seconds and counting. 
things will start to begin. Some of our, our cranes have already pulled away from it. We'll be seeing here shortly, the spark igniters will start sparking to make sure you don't have any excess gas. And then we'll have the shuttle engines kick off. We've got water down here in this trench to suppress the sound. And you can see the shuttle rocks a little bit. And then at T minus zero, those solid rocket engines kick off. Here we are with our solid rocket boosters. We're in a roll process right now. The shuttle rolls about 120 degrees to put itself in the right attitude to take it out over the Atlantic Ocean. And Kirsten, where are we at right now? We are already 5,000 feet above the ground at almost 400 miles per hour. Wow, okay, so we're heading off. And how far down range are we? Down range, we are 3,600 feet. Okay, so we're about a half a mile down range. You can still see Florida there. Gloria, how are we doing on fuel? Uh, we're at 60, 67%. Okay, and, and where's our throttles at this point? Our throttles are at 67% as well. Okay, so about 67% throttles on the main uh, engines here on our boost. We're kicked back a little bit because right now as we start to go faster, you'll see a little bow wave effect. As we break the sound barrier, you'll see the shock wave affecting the space shuttle as well as the boosters. How are we doing on fuel there, Gloria? Our solid rocket boosters are at 61% now. Okay. And going down quickly. <laughs> so those solid rocket boosters, which are producing the majority of our lift, again, are using up that solid rocket fuel and boosting our uh, shuttle into orbit. We're at about 1,500 miles per hour. 1,500 miles per hour. Okay, that's over two times the speed of sound. And again, we're up there at around 72,000 feet. That's, that is up there where you need spacesuits. You need to be careful about the, the lack of air pressure and the, the lack of oxygen at that altitude. Gloria, how are we doing on fuel there for those solid rocket boosters? Uh, we're at 12%, going down 10%, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. <laughs> All right. Well, those solid rocket boosters have about done their job. We're almost out. And when they get down to zero fuel remaining, we're at zero fuel. We have no fuel remaining, and you'll see the solid rocket boosters fall away from the, uh, the external tanks and from the shuttle. Those solid rocket boosters are going to fall back into the Atlantic Ocean. Chutes will come out, so they'll glide back into the ocean and be reused for future flights. And where are we right now, Kirsten? We're at about 62 nautical miles. Okay, 62 nautical miles above the Earth. So right now we're in space, and we're going how fast? About 10,000 miles per hour. We're going 10,000 miles per hour, and it takes about 17,000 miles per hour to actually be in orbital velocity. So we're, we're slowly moving up to get ourselves up to enough speed, enough velocity to keep us in orbit. So as we keep going up now, Gloria, how are we doing with our liquid fuel? Liquid fuel, it's going down really at 4%. Okay, so we have just a little bit of liquid fuel remaining. After the main engine's cut off now, what will happen is the space shuttle will now have an explosive bolt which will separate it from the external tank. There it goes. The explosive bolt just fired, and now the external tank will fall away from the space shuttle, and the external tank will re-enter Earth's atmosphere. So at this point, you'll see the space shuttle start to roll over on its back again, and that's the normal way it's, it, when it's in orbit, it normally flies kind of upside down with the, uh, again, the bottom facing up and the crew facing down. And again, that's used for effective cooling of the space shuttle uh, while it's in orbit. So, we got the shuttle in orbit and uh, everything, we made it safely there, and now it's uh, time to wait for it to come back and land back on Earth. Hey, there's Kevin and Nicole. Here we are at our mission trainer, the other part of our mission trainer, where we have the space shuttle cockpit here. And uh, Kevin's in the commander's position, Nicole's in the pilot's position. And right now we're on base turn, heading into, again, into the Kennedy Space Center for a landing. And right now, again, you can see on, on Nicole's screen, you can see about where we are over Atlantic Ocean, heading into Kennedy Space Center. And Kevin here shows us going, what? how fast are we going there, Kevin? 276 knots. Okay, and, yeah. 276 knots, that's pretty fast. We're in the atmosphere again, so now the parts of the space shuttle are performing like an airplane. We actually have the elevons working, the rudders working, so we can actually fly this by using the stick here that Kevin has to uh, fly it. 
the space shuttle really has a very steep glide slope. The, the space shuttle has about a 22 degree glide slope, where a normal glide slope for a normal commercial airliner is gonna be around the two to three degree glide slope, not 22 degrees. So a real steep glide slope, not a very good glider, sort of glides like a rock. It comes down very fast. You can see us on final approach here. As we approach the little inlet here, we will start to level out. You'll see the nose come up, and as that nose comes up, called flaring, as the space shell starts to flare, it'll be slowing up in speed. And as it slows up in speed, it gets slow enough they can drop the gear, which you just heard come down. We have some airplanes that are on the ramp, checking to make sure everything is going okay. And as we come down the land at Kennedy Space Center, again, it gets a little quieter as we slow up now through 200 knots, again, going slower and slower until those main gear touch down right there, main gear touching down. Then the nose gear will touch down. There we are, nose gear touching down, and now that the drag chute would, would have popped out to help slow you up. The speed brakes come out to slow you up even more. And now Kevin could, with the rudder pedals, use the rudder pedals with his feet to steer the nose of the space shuttle to keep it on the center line here. So again, it stays on right in the middle of the runway. So uh, we could then uh, recover the space shuttle and prepare it for another flight. At this point, let it cool down because it's real hot from re-entry. Let all that dissipate. And then they would take the crew out of the space shuttle and get it to uh, ready to go for another flight. Um, I have a question, actually. Sure. Because we are coming down at such a quick speed and we have to cool off now after being so hot, how did the shuttle survive re-entry? I think our best thing to do there would be go out to the space shuttle and look at it because these uh, thermal protection tiles that we have are kind of, you hear a lot about them, but until you sort of see one in action, it's kind of hard to understand how they work. So let's go out to the space shuttle and take a look at that, Nicole. Well, Nicole, you know, you're asking about how the space shuttle comes back in one piece without burning up, and I wanted to show you an old way we did it before the space shuttle came around. And that's this type of heat shield here. It's called an ablative heat shield. And this type of heat shield is used by the Gemini spacecraft, the Apollo spacecraft, and the Mercury spacecraft. All those types of spacecraft use that type of heat shield to keep the heat of space from getting into the spacecraft itself. And again, the current spacecraft, like the space shuttle, gets up on re-entry to around 2,500, 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and it has to be protected because mainly on the other side of that heat shield is aluminum and aluminum melts at 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you've got a material that your spacecraft's made of that melts at 1200 degrees and your outside temperature is 3000 degrees, you got a problem. You got to find a way to keep that heat from getting to the spacecraft. So Nicole, this is what a heat shield looks like before it goes into space, but I want to do is I want to show you what one looks like after it comes back from space. Well, here's a Gemini heat shield that's been used and you can see some of the spots on it where they actually take some samples out to look at, like this one here. It's all char. It looks like charcoal in many ways. And again, this process by which it all heats up and vaporizes is called pyrolysis. And in the process of pyrolysis, basically the heat, that 3,000 or higher degrees temperature that hits the heat shield when it's re-entering through the atmosphere, makes that heat shield just vaporize, burn up, and basically take that heat back into space. And the whole goal of an ablative heat shield is to make sure you got enough heat shield left over so that when it makes it through the atmosphere, you got enough left over to keep protecting the spacecraft, again, so it doesn't get too hot. So again, this is the effects after pyrolysis, after that charring takes effect, and after you get all that heat on it, you can see the kind of burn pattern, you can see the way that the heat's hit it. So again, an ablative heat shield is only used once, not reusable, very different than our current heat shields, like this one. Here's some space shuttle tiles, both the white and black space shuttle tiles. And these space shuttle tiles are meant to be reusable. They're silicon based, made with silica fibers. Let's go back to the back of the space shuttle and look at some more tiles and how they work. Well, now you saw a Gemini heat shield. Let's, let's look at how we're doing business now with heat shields. And what we use now, again, is with the, the space shuttle here behind the space shuttle enterprise that's behind us, we use a multi-layered way of protecting it. Not just one heat shield, but a lot of different tiles, they call it. Uh, the space shuttle tiles kind of look like this. There's a white tile and there's black tiles. The black tiles have a special coating on it called borosilicate, and these black tiles are very effective. They're good to 2300 degrees of Fahrenheit temperature. The white tiles aren't quite as good, but the white tiles are good to 1200 degrees of Fahrenheit temperature. Now there's a, one other type of uh, protection device on this 
space shuttle. And that's this gray area right here. It's on the leading edge of the wings and also on the nose of the space shuttle, the hottest spots. And the hottest spots, they actually put a different type of, of a system on it called reinforced carbon-carbon. And that reinforced carbon-carbon layer is actually good to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So it gives the best protection of the whole space shuttle system. But the space shuttle really is kind of a layered approach. This space shuttle, when it comes into the atmosphere, it comes in like this. It comes in about three degree nose up, hitting that atmosphere, hitting all those air molecules on the bottom here, pushing the air molecules out of the way and getting real hot. So I was gonna just show you a little thing here about tiles. All the tiles look something like this. This is a white tile, but on the back of it where it's hooked up to the space shuttle and attached to the space shuttle, there's actually a, a, a serial number on it. All the tiles are coded so you know exactly what shuttle was made for, where does it go on the shuttle. And this is a real space shuttle tile again that has a serial number on it. And this is a part that would be glued to the shuttle itself to uh, hold it on. And if we can do a little experiment here, we'll keep an eye on the temperature outside and the temperature inside the shuttle if, Ke if Kevin starts up the atmospheric re-entry. What do we got outside there? Well, the starting temperature on the outside was around uh, 80 degrees, and we're already up to 160. Okay. And how, climbing. How are we doing on the inside there, Kevin? Mine has stayed basically at 78 degrees Fahrenheit the entire time. So as we come back from space again, this space shuttle tile would be hitting those air molecules, and as we coming in at 17,500 miles per hour, hitting those air molecules real heavily and, and hits it real fast, and that temperature just keeps building up and building up. Where are we at now? About 360, I can feel it. Yeah, about <laughs> 360 degrees temperature on the outside, and again, inside? It's still 79 degrees. And that's the whole idea about a space shuttle tile is it absorbs the heat. Instead of the old heat shields that burned up on re-entry, this one doesn't burn up. It absorbs the heat like a big pot holder. And then as the space shuttle starts cooling down, then that reusable tile gives the heat back off to the atmosphere. And again, if the lens is not damaged, it can be reused again. Thanks, Kevin. We'll shut, shut off our re-entry gun there. So how is, how is the shuttle actually piloted in space? Ah, that's a good question, Kevin. In, in space, it's a little different than it is when you were flying in the landing. When you were landing it earlier, up here, if you look on the back of the, the space shuttle, up here you'll see these are the three main space shuttle engines right here. And that's those big engines that pro provided about 17% of your lift on takeoff. And they're the ones that worked off that big external tank that had the liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. But once it's in orbit, then that engine right up there there's a little, there's a black engine right there, right above the main engines, and that's called an orbital maneuvering system, an OMS engine. And the OMS engine, there's one on this side and one on the other side. Those OMS engines, again, are made of what's called hypergolic fuel. The exhaust comes out those OMS engines, and that's what puts the space shuttle into orbit. Or when you want to come back and you want to slow the space shuttle down, they light the OMS engines so that it puts the brakes on. So, whoa, slow me up, slow me up, I'm ready to re-enter. The space shuttle is kind of flying backwards like this, and then these OMS engines light up and slow it up. Slow it up, slow it up, slow it up, until the space shuttle turns around like this and then starts re-entering the atmosphere. So the OMS engines are used to put the space shuttle into orbit, but they're also used to bring it back out of orbit. Now, when it's in orbit and it's just maneuvering around like to hook up the International Space Station or to launch something and needs to change its pitch, uh, again, the space shuttle changes its pitch this way, yaw and roll, and up in space the way it does is these little reaction control system engines right there, those little rockets mix together a fuel and an oxidizer, and they're called, they're called hypergolic because when they mix together, they automatically ignite themselves. So when they basically, when the fuel and the oxidizer mix together there in those engines, they blast off and you get a little pulse of rocket. Psst, psst, psst. And, you'll hear, and these rockets sort of fire off. And then because they're on different planes like this, when those rockets fire, it makes the shuttle either change in yaw, change in pitch, or change in roll by firing the engines back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's in space. Now, when you were landing back in the space shuttle simulator, we saw that those rockets weren't working. Those rockets don't work when you're back in the atmosphere. When you have air molecules available to you, you don't need to use rockets anymore. Now you behave like an airplane. And there's two things back here in the back of the space shuttle. These two areas right here in the back 
Those two tabs back there are called elevons. It's part elevator and part aileron. It's a little bit of both, but because it's on a delta wing like this, those elevator and the ailerons are merged together and they're called an elevon. And those elevons back there, there's two on this side and two on that side, and they move up and down like this. They flex up and down. They make the pitch of the shuttle change, and they also make it roll left and right. Now, the shuttle also has up here, up on the top there, it has right there a rudder. And that rudder behaves like a rudder on a plane. It goes, it, it turns, and as the rudder goes left and right, the shuttle yaws left and right. Now these rudders have one other function. See there's a split in them right there? You can see right there, there's kind of a split in that rudder. Actually that rudder opens up in flight. It's called a speed brake. And so, so if they want to slow the space shuttle down some, once it gets in the atmosphere, that rudder actually splits open and opens causing more drag and it's used to slow things up and when it lands on the runway those speed brakes open up like a book and again causing more drag causing the space shuttle to slow up more so up in orbit behaves kind of like a rocket down on in earth's atmosphere behaves like a plane so that's why we call it a true aerospace vehicle it behaves in both space and in the atmosphere well Kate, that's it for here, and again, we've had a chance to look at the space shuttle today, both how it's protected from heat and also how it performs both in orbit and how it performs down here in the atmosphere. Back to you now. Thanks, Dick. Still ahead, a look at the future of space exploration. But first, it's not magic, it's math. Hi, today we're gonna look at how a space shuttle gets into orbit. So let's look at what we know. We know that the total weight of the system is 4.5 million pounds. The thrust for each solid rocket booster is 3.3 million pounds. The thrust for each main engine is 393.8 thousand pounds. And the velocity when the space shuttle is in orbit is 27,875 feet per second. We have a force due to thrust that pushes the space shuttle upwards, and we have a force due to gravity or the weight that keeps the space shuttle coming down. So we have to have a net force that goes upwards to have the space shuttle actually lift off from the ground. We multiply the 3.3 million pounds for each SRB times the two SRBs that we have. And we add the thrust for each main engine, and we have three main engines. And so we can solve that our thrust is about 7.78 million pounds. But to find out the net thrust, we have to subtract the weight of the space shuttle. So our net force is equal to the thrust minus the weight of the system. And we get a net force 2,981,000 400 pounds. So now we can solve for acceleration. By Newton's second law, we know that force is equal to mass times acceleration. So we can solve for acceleration to be 21.3 feet per second squared. We know our velocity and the acceleration, and so we can solve with the V is equal to acceleration times time equation, and so we can solve that it will take about 1,309 seconds or 22 minutes for a space shuttle to reach orbit. Once space shells are in orbit, one of the things they do is deploy satellites for experiments. Well, hey, I'm working on one right now. Let's go check it out. So here we are in the satellite queen room. We're writing our program for satellites onboard computer. I work with Bethany, Mickey, and Anisha to write the program. So Mickey, why don't you tell them what our satellite's gonna do when it's in orbit? All right, well, there's going to be two satellites and we're working on one of them. They're gonna pop out of a canister and then go into a low Earth orbit about 400 kilometers above sea level. It will send telemetry or any type of data that we want back to the ground station. And also we want to synchronize it to real time. We're learning a lot of different things with this project and some of them include aerospace engineering and systems engineering, but we're also learning a lot about programming different things and electronics and we're very excited about this project. So there you have it. It's not rocket science. Well, actually it is. But if we can do it, you, you can, can do, do it, it too. Thank you, Aisha. Now let's take a look at the future as NASA prepares to return to the moon with Project Constellation. Flight School's Matt Fetters joins us. He's out in front of the museum with a camera crew. Matt, Matt, are you there? Can you hear me? Loud and clear, Kate. Are you ready to go? Set as I'll ever be. As soon as you give the word, I'm ready to go. All right, go for it, but have a safe trip. Thanks, Kate, will do. Select destination.
Destination selected. Stand by. Initializing transport. I love it when it works. Welcome to America's Spaceport, Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Located on the east coast of Florida, Kennedy Space Center is the primary spaceport for NASA. This is the literal jumping off point for astronauts and machines headed to space. All of NASA's human spaceflight missions have launched from here. Ah, much better. I'm standing at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, your gateway to everything this unique facility has to offer. Let's check it out. The Vehicle Assembly Building is one of the largest structures in the world. It's here where the Space Shuttle Orbiter, External Fuel Tank, and Solid Rocket Boosters are assembled before each mission. Once assembly and checkout is complete, the shuttle is ferried to the launch pad aboard a crawler transporter. It takes about five or six hours for the crawler transporter to make the three and a half mile trip from the Vehicle Assembly Building to the launch pad. Millions of people held their breath as the first man set foot on the moon. That journey began just over my shoulder at Launch Complex 39. It was there that the Saturn V rocket blasted off, carrying the crew of Apollo 11 to the moon. I'm over here, underneath this massive piece of equipment, a Saturn V rocket. It's the Saturn V that took the Apollo astronauts to the moon. The Saturn V rocket is 363 feet long. That's longer than a football field. The rockets and spacecraft being designed for NASA's return to the moon are a merging of the best of the best from the Apollo and Space Shuttle eras. The next generation of uh, human spacecraft for NASA will be coming through a program known as Project Constellation. And the name of that human spacecraft is called Orion. Now, Orion has been compared to the Apollo Command Module in shape, but it's certainly larger and certainly more complex than the old Apollo Command Module. The initial goal of the program will be to carry astronauts to and from the International Space Station using this brand new spacecraft. After that, our secondary goal, our next goal, I should say, is to go to the moon, to take humans back to the surface of the moon, and to stay there for longer than we did during the Apollo program. And the eventual goal is to use all this technology in stepping stone fashion to eventually put together a human expedition to the planet Mars. We would anticipate sometime around 2030 to 2035, perhaps. In fact, uh, the Orion will be processed in the Operations and Checkout Building, the same building where we process the Command and Service Modules for the Apollo program, so that's kind of a neat touchstone with history for us. And we will be, of course, responsible for assembly operations in the Vehicle Assembly Building, uh, pre-flight checkout, and then roll out to the launch pad and launch. And as in the past, after we clear the tower, uh, control will be taken over by a Houston Mission Control at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. But Kennedy's role in all this will be pretty much what it has been all throughout the years, pre-flight uh, pre processing, preparation, and uh, launch. Well, that'll do it from Kennedy Space Center, Kate. Back up to you. Kate? Hello, Kate? Matt, Matt can you hear me? Ah, uh, my batteries are dying. How am I going to get home? This is our most desperate hour. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. That's it for this edition of Flight School. Please visit our website. There you will find great resources for further studies in aviation, rocketry, the space program, and much more. Thanks for watching Flight School. For the Fairfax Network, I'm Kate Sullivan. I got it, I got it. Yes, yes, I'm coming in, I'm coming in. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, retro's on. Oh, 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 oh. Did you know that many of the first astronauts were decorated combat pilots and test pilots in the armed forces? 
Today, astronauts come from all walks of life. Oh, oh, oh my. <laughs> Go, go, go! 